We are here to talk about evolving your JavaScript for Backbone.js. Um, it's an advanced beginner to intermediate level dev talk. If you're here to hear Jake Goldman talk about how to recruit developers, or to hear Brennan talk about security, those are the other rooms. So, might experience symptoms involving confusion and alarm if you stay, but you're welcome to. My name is Cadam, um, K. Adam White, but you can call me Cadam. I am a developer for a company here in Boston called Boku. We are an open web technology company. What that means is we do consulting, training, and community development all to promote the adoption of open source web technology. In our consulting business, we work with companies to have them adopt libraries like jQuery and Backbone into their stack and their workflow. We do training to teach developers the best ways to use those technologies, and then we do conference organization, meetup sponsorships. Um, we host meetups in our lofts down in Fort Point. Um, for any sort of open source or, or web technology oriented meetup in town. Um, as individuals, we are really devoted to specific open source projects. Um, a number of my coworkers have created or contributed to, among other things, Backbone itself. jQuery, um, Grunt, which is a build tool for JavaScript, was created by my coworker Ben. And um, we've been really excited to see the growth that particularly JavaScript technology has had over the past couple of years. It's just a really exciting time, particularly with what is happening in WordPress, as we'll talk about today. Um, if you noticed, I've been carrying around stickers. If you've seen me earlier today, I do have more for some of those projects that I mentioned. So if you want those, grab me after. I'm from Chicago, so SOX meant something a little bit different than it does here. Um, but I've been here for about five years. I went to school down in Rhode Island, and I'm actually now one of the co-organizers of the Boston WordPress Meetup group. So I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces here. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being an awesome city with a really exciting tech scene um, to be a part of. It's, it's, I'm having a blast here at the event today. Um, wanted to say a huge round of applause for all the sponsors and volunteers that put in their time and money to make this event actually happen. So. so that's probably enough about me. Who in this room would consider themselves primarily a non-developer? Cool. Um, how about PHP, sort of theme template developer? Pretty familiar with jQuery? Extremely familiar with jQuery. jQuery board member. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just calling you now. Um, we're talking about WordPress and JavaScript here, and historically that has meant primarily jQuery. But it's a really exciting time because um, as new versions of WordPress continue to be released, the most visible features in each of those successive releases end up being the JavaScript-driven features, the user-admin-oriented features. Distraction-free free writing in 3.6, the theme customizer in 3.4, so I'm getting my numbers wrong, media manager and revisions in the, and actually, as of Thursday, um, the password strength uh, indicators in WordPress 3.7, which was just released. These are all features that are made possible through JavaScript because they are happening on the page while the user is in the admin working on their website. There's a quote that I've been using from Andrew Nason, the lead developer on 3.5 and 3.7, um, that he said back in February that 3.5 in the media gallery signified a shift into JavaScript land for a lot of the upcoming features in WordPress. This was a sentiment that was re uh, reiterated by Matt Mullenweg at WordCamp San Francisco and WordCamp Chicago this year, was that a lot of the area for growth for this tool that we work on and that we work with in our jobs as developers is going to be around interface improvements to the admin through JavaScript, providing more robust capabilities for other applications to interact with WordPress using JavaScript. And that's the genesis for what we're going to end up talking here about today. Because as the JavaScript needs within WordPress have changed, the, work, the JavaScript in WordPress has risen to met the challenge, meet the challenge. In 3.5, for the media rewrite, we needed to move beyond jQuery. It is a very, very powerful tool that is extremely good for handling user interaction, events within the browser, fetching data from remote servers via Ajax. It does all of that extremely well, but it was not, did not provide enough structure out of the box to build something as interesting and complex as the media manager without ending up getting really messy. If you've ended up writing a ton of code in jQuery in your theme or your plugin, you might have noticed that the more you write, the more event handlers you have, the harder it becomes to find things and the harder it becomes to change them later on. It's really easy going down that road to end up with a lot of spaghetti code. So in 
two particular libraries were added to WordPress that are going to be the bulk of what we talk about here this afternoon, underscore JS and backbone.js. These three libraries, underscore backbone and jQuery, all create a sort of pyramid um, that supports the JavaScript of WordPress, the core application, and of many things that we as theme and plugin developers and application developers build on top of WordPress or alongside WordPress. jQuery continues to do what it's good at. There's no reason to fix it if it ain't broken. It's an excellent tool for working with HTML documents, AJAX, browser events. The browser's native APIs, jQuery does an excellent job of normalizing them and making them work in a consistent way. Underscore is a utility, a set of utility methods that make it very easy to work with large sets of information. They do really useful things like letting you um, iterate efficiently over collections of objects in a specific way. And then Backbone is a set of structures that is going to tie all of this together. To go into a little bit more depth in Underscore, it's described on its homepage as a utility belt library, and it's a pretty comprehensive utility belt. This is a list of all of the methods that it provides. Whereas jQuery is primarily around to wrap an element on your page and do things to it, Underscore is a library that has just a bunch of methods off of it, each of which does its own thing. So if I do underscore dot is function and I pass in something, it'll tell me if it's a function or not. If I take an array and I say underscore dot unique, it'll give me every object in that array that is unique. It has these methods that let you do a little bit more functional programming, a little bit more um, sort of complex manipulation of your data as you're working with, particularly when you're working with information that you fetch from a remote server, sometimes it's useful to have consistent methods that don't require creating HTML elements and creating DOM elements like jQuery would to iterate and to produce um, new pieces of information. I don't normally say this, but it's actually a really good website to take a look at. Underscorejs.org, um, API documentation is sort of traditionally horrible. Um, but this website does a really good job because it's such a straightforward library of spelling out what all of these methods are. Um, it's worth taking a look at and sort of reading through the different things this can do because underscore is effectively the backbone of backbone. We're here to talk about backbone. It's gotten a lot of press over the past couple of years for sort of changing the way people have been thinking about building web apps. It's certainly been a huge benefit to WordPress and a lot of what makes it work under the hood is actually broken out into underscore and can be taken independently and you can use underscore on its own. So it's worth knowing what it can do. So Backbone. Pardon. As I mentioned, Backbone is little more than a set of repeatable structures for your code. Who's familiar with the term model view controller or model view something? Most of the audience, awesome. Um, Backbone gives you the ability to create a model, which is a structured way to store a piece of data, a collection, which is a set of one or more similar models, and then views to render them and to take user input. We're pretty comfortable as developers at this point separating our rendering from our logic. In WordPress themes, you're used to putting most of the actual hard logic in functions.php and actually only referencing those functions in your templates as needed rather than putting a lot of complex logic in you know, index.php or page.php. In the same way, it's really useful in JavaScript to not have to have one jQuery method that's responsible for listening for an event, figuring out some data, and then rendering it. Breaking those apart a little bit lets us write code that we can come back to later on and not cringe. Models are, at the root, very simple. You simply take, you extend Backbone's own model constructor to make a constructor that you can pass in an object. The instance of my model here is a Backbone model to which I've simply assigned the data prop1 some data, prop2 you want to store in a structured way. By making a backbone model for this object, rather than doing you know, variable.prop1, I would simply say model instance.getprop1. This is what I was talking about structure. Um, by being explicit about getting and setting the information in this model, I can write code that it's a little bit more obvious that you know, this is a piece of data that you want to treat as a unit, and then there's a particular item that you want to fetch on top of it. And this comes into play when you're using a view which is designed to render out that model. In this case, a view is simply something that you extend the backbone zone native view constructor, and you give it a render method. Our render method takes a jQuery object and prints out the value, the value of that model. Um, we bind the two together. When we make the view, we actually tell it which model we want to refer to. So we're pointing out at the one that we create here. 
then every time we call viewInstance.render, it's going to set the contents of whatever element we specify to the value of that view. This ends up being a lot more code than if you're simply creating and setting um, simple properties on JavaScript objects. But it's definitely worth it. The difference is that if I want to re-render this, if I want to change one of those pieces of data, if I wanted to make prop2 mean some data you want to store in a less structured way, I would have to set that and then re-render the HTML, whereas with Backbone, you can set up relationships between views and models that are driven by events. The same way that when you click on a page, something might happen that you specified an event. Like when you click on the page, hide or show this element. You can specify those types of, of relationship between models and views so that every time your model changes, the view will automatically re-render itself. This means that all I have to do to update that view is set the model. You don't have to worry about how it's presented beyond setting the information once you've set it up the first time. More work up front tends to mean less down the road. Um, there's definitely exceptions to this rule, but we found that structuring your code and spending the extra time to think about how the relationships between your data and your views work saves you a lot of effort as you're trying to go back and make changes and enhance what you've written. There was a quote I heard in the presentation last summer that said, the first time you sit down at your computer and fire up your text editor, you're developing, but as soon as you've looked away or answered a phone call and come back, now you're debugging. The more that you can do to make the code that you're writing something that you can sit down and immediately understand, the faster you're gonna be. A lot of people have told me that this ends up being sort of an intimidating jump because they might know basic jQuery, but they keep hearing the backbone is all about building these complex web applications. This is RDO, the music player. There's a whole bunch of apps on the backbone site. There's sort of case studies for how this is being used in the wild. A lot of them are extremely powerful, very complicated web applications. And there's this disconnect between how you're starting with jQuery and ending up with backbone. There's a couple steps in the middle there that get a bit hazy, and it can be um, intimidating to understand how you're going to go from moving your feet sideways to whatever that means. This is a paraphrased threadless shirt. Um, it's not actually that hard, and we're going to demonstrate that by actually taking a small piece of the theme that's written in a very traditional way using jQuery and refactoring it to be not only more better structured and easier to use as a developer, but also better for the user. The demo that we're going to be using is a homepage image gallery. Actually, fire this up. So this, you come to a page, you've got a row of thumbnails, you click on one, it shows you a piece of artwork. This is something that, you know, we used to have sliders at the tops of every theme. Fortunately, we're moving away from that a little bit. The sliders are irritating, but it's still sometimes very nice if you have a photo site or an art site to be able to display a set of thumbnails and let people get a, a slightly larger preview before they click through. I've seen this type of feature in a number of different sites. The sort of basic way that you would write this is mostly through PHP. Um, in this case, the first implementation we had here was simply in the header for this website. We would check to see if you're on the front page. If we were, they would get an artwork item, iterate through that loop, print out the featured image divs one after the other, and then go through again and print out all of these thumbnails. So that there's six containers here and six thumbnails here, clicking on one, activates the respective elements on the page. This isn't necessarily a bad way to do it, and it definitely leads to not having a whole lot of JavaScript to deal with. Um, there's probably more lines here than there would even need to be because I'm you know, caching variables and stuff for performance, but basically all we're doing is when you click on something, hide and show what you've asked for. This works, but if anyone was in Ethan Marcotte's talk this morning, this comes out to 1.5 meg, that sort of risen average of page weight that we were talking about. This is the type of behavior that leads to those really heavy pages um, that lead to really long page times, like page load times. The issue that we're experiencing here is that we're rendering all of these large images even if the user has only come to the site to browse down and read Hello World. We don't want to punish them for not being interested in something they might have seen before or might not be relevant to their interests. You want them to be able to get to what they've come to your site for as quickly as possible. So the first thing we can do 
is we can make a very basic jQuery optimization to move those hidden containers out of the document. In this case, we're in the PHP just looping once. And rather than rendering out each hidden featured image area, we're skipping that entirely. That's an empty container that's hidden by default. And then we're only rendering out the thumbnails. On each thumbnail, we're setting a bunch of data attributes that give us all the information we need to construct that featured image area later on. This is a little bit messy, but this is definitely one of the most straightforward ways to get downloading those images to happen later on, and to not have to iterate through the loop twice. So, do you hear like weird buzzing? Yeah. It's just me. It doesn't necessarily make it better. <laughs> um, I don't know how to make it stop. We're just going to keep going. <laughs> By defining all of these data properties, data attributes on this element, we can read those in off of that element using jQuery. The data method is designed to take those HTML5 data elements and produce an object that we can work with in JavaScript. We've created a render method that we can pass that information, so we actually generate the HTML within the JavaScript based on what we've read in, and then we spit it out into the featured content area. So, what this looks like is the exact same thing, just now when you're clicking on it, it's downloading the images as requested. When, when you actually click on that thumbnail, then it's downloading that image, which gives you all the same functionality, but doesn't penalize your users if they're not interested in them to begin with. Fewer downloads is a faster page load. We've cut the page weight just by this one change to 40% of what it was. But we've ended up with a lot of slightly less than optimal JavaScript code. The biggest problem with this is that we now have a whole bunch of HTML in our JavaScript file. We were trying to separate presentation from our um, from the data from our presentation. Well, now we've just aggregated HTML into a JavaScript file, which you, good luck finding that if you're trying to solve a bug at 3 in the morning when your client calls you. Um, you know, have to deal with multiple types of quote mark, commas, plus signs. Building strings in JavaScript in this fashion is really frustrating. This type of stuff drives me crazy, and there is definitely a better way. Underscore, one of the useful methods that it provides is a template method. JavaScript templating is a more sort of idiomatic way to write HTML and have it be available for JavaScript to process. You write your HTML like you normally would, but you insert delimiters that tell you, that point you at content that you're going to load from JavaScript. So the same way that you would if you're writing PHP, you know, PHP echo variable name, we can simply have, you know, div bracket main content. That means when I create a template function from this, it's going to make a function that takes in an object. If that object has a main content property, it will get rendered in here. So, is that big enough for people to see? So STR is our static string representation, but if we make a template out of it, now it's a function. And if we trigger that function with some object, yay, it went away. Um, <laughs> then it will take that and it will very efficiently put that together into a string. Oh, I tempted you, didn't I? <laughs> so this ends up being a lot faster than building HTML using jQuery, and it's definitely a lot easier to read um, rather than doing, you know, creating an A element and then setting its attribute href equals something else. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take that markup that we were rendering in, HTML, in uh, JavaScript and turn it into a basic template. It ends up being a lot cleaner. You don't have all of those weird quote marks. It's very obvious which pieces of the content come from JavaScript versus from the HTML. And we can take that, and I'm not going to go into the specifics of how this step works. There's a bit of a pure miracle curse to this, but I'm using Grunt to pre-compile that template. There's a lot of ways to do this that are outside of the scope of what we've talked about, but the code's all up on GitHub. Um, we go in, we grab that template, it creates a function, and now we can just call that function, and it will take the file that we've written that's very easy for us to read and write, and generate the rendered markup using it. So now that we've done that, we can actually start moving into using Backbone to break up the structure of our code. 
we're building an art gallery, so the main thing we want, the main piece of information that we care about, is going to be that featured image here. What the featured image is at any point is really the only thing that we particularly care about in this model. So, I mean, sorry, in this application. So this becomes the model that we're interested in. We then have also one view to go along with that model. If we're setting this, the view that we care about is actually going to be rendering that out. So what we do is we build a backbone view. We tell it that it's going to live in the artwork featured container. We tell it where its template is. We have it render by using that template to spit out HTML. And then we have it listen to the model. This is that event binding that I was talking about. We set up a relationship where this featured image container will automatically render when we set the model. And it will also show itself the first time. Listen to once is a nice event handler, similar to jQuery.1, um, FN.1, that was added as powder backbone 1.0, which came in with WordPress 3.6. Linking these together in our main app then becomes very easy. We create an artwork model, we create a featured artwork view that knows about that model, and then every time we do artwork set, the view is going to re-render itself. We now no longer have to worry about asking that part of our page to render in our event handler. We can simply say, when the user clicks on this, figure out what they wanted, and set it. So it's definitely making progress here. We're getting a little bit more structured. But the more models and views you create, eventually you'll run into situations where it's really confusing what is going on in one individual file. So we're actually going to take our files and we're going to split them up. We're going to put the models into a models.js file, views into one other file, and then we're going to have our little application file that's only going to take the constructors that we've put in those files and actually put them together on the page. I'm not going to show the codes of that because I'm just moving things around. So there's a couple other things here that we could use Backbone for that we so far have not. And actually, let me... So that banner up at the top, you probably want to make a view for that because it reacts to setting that model. These thumbnails, we probably want to make a view for them because they need to set that thumbnail. We can clean up the relationships here a little bit by making some more models. The banner, very simple. When it is created, it knows about a model and it will hide itself as soon as that's set the first time. That's all that we need it to do. The first time you click on one of these, you want that banner to go away. We give it a show method, but we're never going to call it. It doesn't really have any hope. Um, the thumbnail view, on the other hand, is responsible for figuring out what you've clicked on and setting the model. It doesn't need to render anything, it just needs to interpret the user's action. So when you click, action, Backbone provides this really nice syntax for specifying an event to fire on a particular action within that view. In this case, whenever I click on an A tag inside this view, I'm going to fire the select method. All the select method does it gets the data using jQuery form from the thumbnail that we rendered out in PHP, and then it will set that model onto the that um, data onto their model. This means that the actual real application code, now that we've built those structures, this is all that our main JS file needs to do. We're defining one model, and we're using that model on three different views, all of which communicate together through that eventing. Um, this is about as separated as this can possibly get, and it means that if you need to work on any individual part of this, um, when you're like coming back and you're trying to add you know, some sort of other animation or maybe some other type of data that you need to render out for a client, you know exactly where to go, and the relationships between the data and the views are really clear. Um, all of the code for this, by the way, is up on GitHub. Um, the links are going to be in these slides, which I'll have a link up for at the end of the talk. If any of this, if you're curious about any of this, it sort of goes through step by step what we just talked about, but please open issues, um, submit pull requests if you see something that could be done better. Um, this is meant to sort of be an evolving resource. And there's actually a video from this part of the talk I did it, and Providence as well, and that video is up on WordPress TV. So just resources for further reading. Backbone can be used as little or as much as you want. We looked at using it to do one little micro application inside a larger theme. You can also use it to build sort of more complicated um, full-on web applications, as we were talking about with RDO, Newsplur, some of these other sites that um, get talked about a lot as being standout backbone applications. One of the commonalities is that they're largely communicating their data over the wire as JSON. They're 
using JavaScript object notation to pass data from a server and digest it in the browser, rather than doing what we did, which was to render out all of the data as HTML5 data attributes. This leads us to look at ways we can use WordPress as an API, because rather than just rendering out HTML, WordPress has a database. It has a really structured way of storing data. If we can expose that to the browser through an API, JavaScript can go out and grab individual pieces of data and then do whatever it wants with them. There's a couple plugins that will do this. The JSON API plugin from the MoMA team was the first one that I was aware of that was sort of largely available in the plugin repository. More recently, um, the JSON REST API plugin that Ryan McHugh worked on as part of the Google Summer of Code has been a, a very interesting sort of candidate for building apps on top of WordPress. It was possible just to install this plugin, which is designed to work either as a plugin or as part of a WordPress install. You drop the files into WP Includes, and then you have the ability to hit um, your site slash wpjson.php, and it'll give you back JSON representations of whatever you asked for. So that phone goes out, grabs that data, and can do whatever we want with it. For example, if we wanted to put together a collection of posts, this is using the older JSON API, but we can do just you know make a new collection, tell it that it's going to use the post model, and give it a URL to the JSON API's endpoint, where you're going to get that JSON data from. And then Backbone now has a JavaScript object array with each one an object of post items. Each is a Backbone model. Each can be wired up to specific views with events. And you don't really have to worry about any of the specifics of how you get at that information beyond doing this initial wiring. So we're going to take a quick demo just to sort of show what this can look like. So what we're going to do is we're going to blow away and rebuild the loop in JavaScript. At least that's so we can type faster. Oh, it'll be back. Don't worry. So I just emptied out the content container. I took everything, all the work that PHP did to render out your post the first time around, threw it away. We don't need it. We're going to take, um, this site is also running a plugin that um, gives me one or two small helpers on top of the existing, um, on top of the existing JSON API. So first thing that we're going to do, we're going to load I have an external template um, at this file. I have put a JavaScript template. That looks like this. It's just a re representation of a post. It's basically the same markup that you would end up having in um, contentpost.php or something. Um, what I've done is I've used jQuery to go out, get it, and to create using underscore template a rendering method on the global objects, because this is a demo and we can get away with that sort of thing when we're doing demos. Um, next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to create a WP JSON API posts collection. It gives us this nice JavaScript file already that lets us do things like WP API collections.posts. This now automatically knows about the endpoint that the JSON API provides for your posts. So all I'm going to have to do to create a front-end object that I can use post that, that will contain posts that I can then manipulate is run this code and then fetch posts, which we will do in just a moment. First, we need a view. Um, I created a view constructor. Oops. Oh, that's a bad example. Um, I created a view constructor. You'll just have to trust me there. <laughs> um, will take in an object and create a posts, it will take the posts collection and it will render them out into the content section. So I'm saying, I'm actually just do this, um, it'll take the content element, it'll take the post collection, and it'll render them. Now that I've done that, all I have to do actually sync with the server, it goes out through the JSON API, grabs all that data, brings it back, packages up in backbone models, and then passes each one through the view that I've created to render out basically the same stuff that we would get. You get 
all of the parsing that you would normally have, it just it happens and then it gets converted into HTML and sent as part of JSON rather than being rendered out on from the server on page load. This is kind of cool because it means you can take a theme and pretty easily rewrite it so that when you click on a link, rather than reloading the entire page, maybe you just want to go out and fetch more data and load that asynchronously. We're going to have to move pretty quick because I realize I'm running out of time. Um, but this is something that's being done in a couple places in the real world. Theme Foundry um, released a theme um, a month and a half ago, two months ago, called Collections, which is, as far as I'm aware, the first premium backbone-driven theme that's out in the wild. It's a really cool theme in that it's post-format driven, so it's got some nice presentation that's specific to the type of content you're presenting, but whenever you click on something, this is what it does under the hood. It's the same sort of thing. It'll go out, it'll make a request to the server, get back just the data that you've asked for, and then only render that data. It won't have to completely re-download the whole header and everything else. It just gets what you've asked for to change and displays those changes, which makes it much snappier and much more performant for the user. O2 is an interesting plugin that's being developed at Automatic. It's meant to be a successor to P2, which is their project management theme that I think probably a lot of you are fairly familiar with. P2 is used very heavily to structure the work on WordPress as an open source project. O2 is a sort of reimagining of P2 as a JavaScript application. And um, it can take many different themes in many different forms, but the idea is provide a set of um, dynamic, you know, on-page reloading, backbone-driven tools that will let you take this powerful project management tool and make it even more responsive and even more real-time. But you don't have to stop at themes and plugins. It's possible in the manner of a lot of these applications that get held up as examples of how well Backbone works to make standalone JavaScript and HTML applications that can still use WordPress as their backend. Through the WordPress.com API, through the JSON REST API that we've already looked at, there's a lot of ways to get at uh, data using JavaScript from WordPress, and you don't have to be on that site to make use of it. Jetpack actually also provides the WordPress.com API on self-hosted blogs as well. So there's, a, you know, that's probably the most widely distributed amounts of, you know, if you want data from WordPress, the .com API is going to be your best bet for the time being, just because there is no API in core currently, and this means that every theme with Jetpack with this enabled and every blog on uh, WordPress.com, you can get at that data remotely from PHP, from JavaScript, from apps, whatever you need. So we're going to, in the last five minutes here, build a standalone blog viewer that will go out and just use WordPress for its data. We're going to use it with buzzwords, which means bootstrap, and we're going to be missing vowels for no clear reason, and we're going to be using Backbone naturally. This is sort of what it's going to look like. This runs as a GitHub page. There's nothing but HTML and JavaScript going on right here. But you'll notice when I load, it has that little spinner. It goes out and it uses the .com API to grab that information, that data, and pull it back. What's happening under the hood is that we have a view here that listens for a URL. It's the WordPress.com blog by default. Then once it has a URL, it sets a model, makes a request, gets data from that, and then renders it out. Basically the exact same structures and ideas that we were talking about before, but now it's operating as a standalone app rather than as even part of a WordPress site. Um, who's got a .com blog or Jetpack? Enable blog here. What's the URL? Um, uh, Helen.wordpress.com. Just pros that I'm not, not making this up. Um, any blog that expose, that is on WordPress.com should, you can get at that data and you can work with it through this API, and that can be used to make some really cool things um, that we're not going to go into because most of them haven't been invented yet, but you should. And that's where we go from here. It's possible to use Backbone to make better websites, better structured code for websites, by pulling apart the interaction onto your page into structured elements. It, it opens you up to be more experimental and potentially more powerful in the ways you're listening to and reacting to user feedback. Um, you can also use it to write, as we were talking about, standalone apps like this little post lister thing that just go out and get data from WordPress, bring it back, and do something interesting with it. And then finally, this is actually being used to enhance core. As I mentioned, Backbone was brought on for 3.5 because it was needed as a structuring mechanism for the code for the media rewrite. There's a lot of 
new areas of growth and development within WordPress itself as a web application where Backbone and more advanced JavaScript structures and techniques can do a lot of good. So there's definitely a need and a desire for more people to dive into this and to understand how it works so that WordPress can be as awesome as we all want it to be. And just very briefly on that note, there have been a couple of WordPress-specific tools that are now part of core thanks to this, these projects. WP Backbone JS is a wrapper around Backbone that provides some WordPress-specific view handling. Um, Daryl Coopersmith, who wrote the majority of the code for the Media Gallery, broke out the sub-view management in that tool into its own module that can be used to handle nested views. Nested views are sort of traditionally frustrating to deal with in Backbone and a lot of applications because there's a whole lot of issues you have to start worrying about as soon as you have one view that contains another view that contains a set of other views that all contain subviews themselves. Subviews is one crack at that that's very specific to the needs we've had as a project that you can, you know, enqueue the same as any other script in core and make use of in your own projects. It all works by having a custom wrapper around backbone.view that's for WordPress. <coughs> WP.backbone.view does a couple things to sort of be subview aware, so it will be smart about rendering itself and getting rid of itself if it's inside a subview that's being hidden or shown. And also, finally, WP.template, which is a wrapper around underscores templating mechanism that makes a couple assumptions about you know, the fact that you might have your templates on the page, loaded with an ID via jQuery, you might want to make sure that, and it, it does things like make sure that you're using um, delimiter syntax that's not going to conflict with old versions of PHP or ASP. Um, the final issue that sort of always gets brought up the more we talk about Backbone is the competition. There's a lot of applications, I mean, there's a lot of um, JavaScript libraries out there that have sort of sprung up over the past couple of years to handle the problem of structuring your code and binding elements on your page to your data. AngularJS, Ember, the list goes on. Um, I feel like there's a new one every week, actually. There, a lot of them are really, really good tools. I've been working with Angular for a while. Um, as with any library, it has its own frustrations, but it does a lot of really interesting things. Ember, another very, very interesting project that's very powerful and is being used to great success by companies like Square and others. Each one of these will have their own strengths and weaknesses. Backbone's not going anywhere in general because it's just become so widely adopted. They definitely got a lot of buy-in just by being first to the punch at having a good solution to this problem of code structure and JavaScript. And I do think that Backbone is probably the best solution to WordPress because of its flexibility. Angular and Ember in particular get talked about as opinionated frameworks, which means that there's a lot of things that they want you to do. They want you to play by their rules in order to use the library. <coughs> Backbone in their documentation on backbonejs.org says there's more than one way to do it. That works pretty well for WordPress because we can use it just in areas like the media gallery. We can do things like wrap it in WordPress specific handlers. It can be customized to choice, and that's definitely a strength when you're taking a large 10 year old application like WordPress and finding ways to modernize it and reimagine how pieces of it work on a case by case basis. So I definitely support um, Andrew Nason and Dalkup Smith and all the other developers that settled on Backbone. I do agree that it was the right choice. I'm really excited to see where it goes, and I encourage you all to jump in. It's not scary. It's incredibly flexible. It's really easy to get started because you can use it in very, very simple ways without jeopardizing the rest of your application. And the only thing that's left for us to do is to play with it and see what we can build. So that's all the time I have. Thank you. The slides are up there, and I think that I'm about out of time, but I can probably take one or two questions during the passing period. So.